I see. So it seems that your book actually managed to spark some interest and further or deeper research into that specific field. Well, I wouldn't want to say it wouldn't want to take too much of the credit, but certainly I feel that I've made a bit of a difference to influencing people's research priorities. It's not just with the book, of course. I've done a lot in terms of simply bringing the right scientists together. Science in in general, and certainly biology, tends to get over uh, fragmented, over balkanized, uh, and the result is that people just don't hear about each other's work, even when it could be very valuable to their own work. So I try to identify cases where people's work may, may be in this sort of situation, and I bring people together, whether it's just informally in private meetings or whether it's at conferences, or also that's one of the big um, roles of the journal that I edit, Rejuvenation Research. So is that the function of the Sense Foundation to, as you said, fill in the gaps or put the pieces together so that there could be progress towards the goal of defeating aging and extending a healthy human life? I, I, I would say that is basically it, yes. I regard the Sense Foundation as the hub of the um, rejuvenation biotechnology effort. We are out there to make sure that all the various components of rejuvenation biotechnology are actually developed in as soon as possible and that none of them gets neglected simply because it looks too hard or people don't understand why it should be valuable or whatever. So in general, we don't fund things that we don't need to fund because they're already being done, but we try to make sure that everything that is not is being neglected by other people gets pushed forward as quickly as possible. And what about those who criticize you that your function in that case is one of management management or coordination rather than uh, hard science? Oh, I don't think there's much danger of that criticism because we definitely are funding a lot of hard science. I mean, I personally spend a lot of my time doing interviews like this, for example, or giving lectures around the world, uh, or for that matter, just speaking to potential donors. Uh, just as a way of educating the general public as well as um, as well as the scientific community. Uh, but the people that we fund are indeed doing very hard science. We have a an in-house laboratory of our own in California, and we also fund a variety of projects in universities around the world. So absolutely, we are a regular funding body in that way. That's fantastic. So why don't you give some more information to those of our listeners who are interested to find out more about the Sense Foundation in general or even are willing to donate and contribute to your cause? Sure. Well, of course, the most important thing to do is go to our website, www.sense.org. That's S-E-N-S, -E of course, not S-E-N-S-E. -E. Um, and you'll find all about, all about the research that we do there. Uh, but to give a brief summary, uh, I guess our flagship program, research program, is what we call LysoSense, the approach that we have taken to the elimination of molecular garbage that accumulates inside cells. It turns out that that problem, which happens in different ways in different types of cell, is a major cause, in fact the major cause, of some of the most important diseases of old age. In particular, it's definitely the main cause of cardiovascular disease and also macular degeneration, which is the major cause of blindness in the elderly. And we are adopting an approach which involves identifying other species, typically bacteria, that are able to break down the compounds that accumulate in these various cell types and cause the cells eventually to stop working. Um, and then to identify the genes that those species have which allow them to break down these things. When we can do that, we can transfer those genes with some subtle modifications uh, to mammalian cells, to normal human cells in cell culture first and then uh, potentially to mice in the laboratory, to live mice and eventually of course to humans themselves. And this project has been going quite well for quite a long time. We've got pretty good at finding bacteria that can break down things that we don't like the look of. And we've also got pretty good at finding the genes that allow them to do it. We are now focused mainly on step three, the transferring of those genes to mammalian cells in culture. 
And we have three researchers working on that right now in our laboratory in California. We also have two more working on it in Houston at Rice University. So that's our biggest project at the moment. That is very interesting indeed. So uh, has Craig Venture's most recent synthetic biology discovery or his previous work on the Human Genome Project had any impact on your direct work or the field that you're working in, in general? I'm not sure whether Craig's work on synthetic biology is really directed in this sort of way. So he got a great deal of publicity recently, of course, for transferring the genome of one type of um, bacterium into another one and getting the new bacterium to be essentially reprogrammed by the new DNA. And of course, he made a great deal of play out of the fact that the new genome had actually been synthesized from scratch rather than simply extracted from the other species. Um, but really, this doesn't tell us any actual information that we didn't know about how particular genes work or how particular enzymes work. However, there is plenty of other work that Craig and indeed other synthetic biologists are doing that could indeed have plenty of relevance to all of this. Simply, simply the work that Craig is doing identifying environmental DNA, you know, just trawling the oceans for sequences that appear to be the, to encode strange new enzymes, for example, that is definitely something that could be relevant to all of this. Very interesting. And what about the move from biology to synthetic biology? And it would be very interesting to find out since uh, you started out as a computer scientist rather than a pure biologist, uh, it would be very interesting to find out what is your take on the parallels being drawn between computer science and software programming and biology and some of the claims such as uh, the claim that cells are software driven biological machines and uh, DNA is a biological code similar to the code of uh, software programming. Um. I think, I think we have to be very careful with that analogy. It's an easy analogy to make, and a lot of people make it. I think some people take it a bit too far. The difficulty, of course, is that the DNA code is not like source code. It's like object code, which is very, very hard to understand without any comments or anything. And most of the work that we have to do is in the line of understanding how the code works, which is not something that synthetic biology is yet very good at. In fact, quite recently, the 10 year anniversary of the sequencing of the human genome was celebrated and Craig Venter again, of course, and also Francis Collins, who um, was heading the public genome sequencing effort, were um, at pains to emphasize and certainly to admit that the actual practical outcome of having the human genome has so far been pretty modest. I'm quite sure that as time goes on, and as more experiments get done more rapidly and more easily as a result of having such good sequencing technology, we will indeed benefit progressively more and more. But I think so far, synthetic biology or indeed the general concept of biology as information is still very much in its infancy. In that case, would you say that so far the the perception or, or the presumption behind synthetic biology is unproven? I think, I think unproven is a fine word, yes. I think I'm optimistic about the informatic, the, the, the bioinformatics future, so to speak. But I think, yes, it's in its infancy. I see. Let me move on to another dimension of your work, and that is the religious implications. If you are successful in your quest to defeat aging. Uh, so first of all, do you have any religious affiliations yourself? I don't have any religious affiliation myself, no. I think personally, however, that the arguments um, about the relationship between this work and religion are actually pretty clear. And they are simply that not only is this work compatible with Holy Scripture, it's actually mandated by Holy Scripture. It, in other words, it would be a sin not to work on all of this. 
because the fact is aging is bad for you aging causes a great deal of suffering and it kills people and scriptures of all the major religions are pretty unequivocal that we have a duty a moral a moral obligation to work to minimize suffering we can think in the christian tradition for example about the parable of the good samaritan where we hear about people who walked by on the other side and did nothing when someone was suffering and they are compared unfavorably to the good samaritan who took the trouble to actually help i think the situation is exactly the same here we have a moral obligation to help now, of course, some people are inclined to have a sort of knee jerk reaction about this when they hear about the possibility that we might extend lives a lot. And they'll say, well, hang on, this is sort of playing God. It's taking our um, lives out of God's control. But that's complete nonsense, of course. You know, if God exists and is omnipotent, then God can perfectly well strike you down with a thunderbolt, however healthy you are. So we're not changing anything in that regard. Now, of course, some people may take a sort of if you like a secretly selfish um, attitude, they may say, well, you know, there's this heaven that they're going to, that's such a be so much better a place to be than we are down here. Um, and therefore, they don't want this technology that might delay their um, transition to the next world. But of course, that's also sinful, according to the major scriptures, in the same way that one's not supposed to commit suicide. So, you know, whatever way you look at it, it's pretty damn clear that this is something that is God's work. And there may indeed be some hesitation on the part of the major religions simply because they will see how very profoundly society will be altered and perhaps they will feel that from a purely administrative point of view their power in, the, in this world their, their influence may decline but in terms of actual theological dogma i think it's completely clear that any such arguments will be very short-lived and that there will in due course be very strong support for this work from major religions. If you don't have any religious affiliation, would you say that you're an atheist in that case? I would prefer to say that I'm an agnostic. I've always felt since I was quite young that it didn't matter to me whether God exists or not, because it seemed to me that the sorts of things that I had already decided I wanted to do with my life, basically, as I've mentioned earlier, humanitarian things, well, clearly what I would be doing, whether or not I believed in God, and therefore it wasn't something that I needed to spend time making a decision on. And how do you respond to those of your critics who blame you for modeling yourself as a Jesus Christ type of a figure who is promising immortality to the masses? Well, of course, I don't think much of any description of my work that uses the word immortality because I'm not working on immortality. I'm working on keeping people healthy, as I said earlier. And people, I'm not working on stopping people from being hit by trucks or any other cause of death. I'm just working on one cause of death. Um, some people like to say that I look a bit like Jesus, but, well, they say that about a lot of people, so I don't really pay much attention to that. As far as I'm concerned, all I'm doing is the same as what any other technologist is doing. I'm trying to improve people's quality of life and I don't think it's very easy to criticize that. Speaking of people's quality of life, would you mind giving some specific tips or advice to our listeners who are probably interested in being healthy for as long as possible until the moment that we do have those technologies that you're describing and that you're working on which would allow them to extend their life almost indefinitely. 